Hello again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd. It's really hard to believe we are already on our third show. You can get in touch with us with your garden questions by dialing 1-800-676-5446. You can also contact us via email with questions and pictures. That address is byf at unl.edu. Please tell us where you live and give us as much information as you can so we can give you a good answer. Do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can see all those past shows and all of our educational videos. We are also on Facebook so you can follow Backyard Farmer throughout the week. As always, we're gonna start with samples. Jody, you brought like a Gentry. plethora. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I brought carpenter ant samples and the way to identify a carpenter ant is not by the color or the size. It's going to be of the shape of the body. So head, thorax, abdomen for insects. That middle section is going to be evenly rounded, as you can see in that picture. It will have one node, which you can't see in that picture, between the thorax and the abdomen. But it's that evenly rounded thorax that is going to be the carpenter ant. And they can be different colors. They can be different sizes. But you'll see across here that I've got some workers. I've got swarmers, which are really large, and they have wings. This is the only time during these dispersal mating swarms that the males exist in the colony. And then you will see giant ants that don't have wings, and those are D alates, so those are fertilized queens. So those swarming events happen annually, depending on, I don't know, where you live. But these carpenter ants, they will nest in wood, but they don't feed on the wood. So they excavate the galleries and they will kick out what we call ant frass, which is coarse sawdust, which you can see actually stuck to this glue board down here or in this pile in this container. It will have insect parts as well if you examine it because carpenter ants will need a protein source. So they feed on other insects. So they're actually quite beneficial. So signs of damage will look like this. They clear out the galleries in the wood. It's usually dead and decaying wood that could be in a tree. If there's a nest in your house, you may find piles of frass, you may hear chewing, and it sounds like cellophane in the walls, or you may see foraging ants, especially at night, because they're nocturnal. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to stay on track because I, this is not a lightning round question. Management, <coughs> you need to locate the nest. So the nest is important because when you treat the nest, you'll treat the queen, all the eggs, the larvae, they will eliminate the colony. If you're just treating foragers, that's not gonna eliminate the colony. So you have to find the nest, but they can forage really far. So the nest may be in your neighbor's yard. You can't treat your neighbor's yard. So if it's in your yard, try to keep them out of the house. If it's in your house, call a professional. They have the the expertise to get rid of those. Um, baiting is not gonna work if you're using sugar baits. If you're trying something over the counter for carpenter ants, they may feed on the sugar because sugar's great, but they have a very wide, extensive nutritional um, requirement. They need that protein. So you'll need to get a dual action bait. All right, and there's something terrifying about ants being so chewy that they sound like cellophane in your wall. Like, thanks for adding a new nightmare. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Rock, what, uh, what weed that we're already tired of hearing about do you have in your hand? So this is henbit, and a lot of our viewers know what it is. Uh, it's a winter annual, and so basically this is a weed that uh, germinated last fall, um, overwintered, and then came out with, you know, gangbusters. It really loves these cooler temperatures. Um, it's got a very distinct uh, serrated leaf, um, and also not to confuse it with ground ivy. Um, ground ivy, the flowers are at the axles of the leaf and the stem, whereas henbit, they're usually at the end of the stem and they're trumpet shaped. So don't, don't want to confuse those two. In terms of management, it's too late to do anything at this point in time. Oh, and I did, I did forget that the, they have square stems. It's a member of the mint family, uh, fairly common for most of our growers. You can see that, there we go. That's a square stem, so it kind of keeps it all by itself in terms, there's a few other things with square stems, but mostly it's just the mints. Um, in terms of management, uh, you can't do anything now unless you are just irritated and want to spray it with something, which is not what we recommend. Really, you should have put a pre-emergent down in the, um, in the fall and you would have done a pretty good job on it. And also in a landscape bed or in a uh, turf situation, healthy, dense turf or mulch will do a great job in uh, suppressing it and making sure it doesn't germinate. All right, excellent rock. Okay, Amy, a spruce of some sort. It is a spruce. <laughs> it's a very old spruce, so I stopped at a 
rural cemetery my way down today. And so, by the way, the cemetery was started in 1847, and I think these spruce are probably about the same age. They're very wow. old. But the main reason why I grabbed them is I'm starting to get some phone calls about brown needles on my trees. Oh my goodness, my tree is sick and my tree is dying. But the big thing is we need to take a look at those brown needles. And what we're seeing here is it's not uniform across the branch. It's on the newer growth and it's turning brown from the tip and working its way back down. And as it's turning color, some of them are actually, you know, it starts out as a, a darker brown and then it almost turns white. Um, and if you take a look, you're not seeing any spots on the needles. There's no black dots on the branch. What this really is is winter desiccation or just desiccation in general. Um, and this has been a really big problem this year because in general, uh, we've been fairly dry this, this winter. And up in my neck of the woods, I'm about ready to call us the desert up there, with the 60 mile per hour winds that we've had for, it seems like the last two and a half months, plus the fact that we haven't had moisture, I'm seeing a lot more desiccation right now because people aren't out watering your trees yet. You're thinking, well, it's getting down in the 30s at night. I don't need to be watering my trees. Wrong. These evergreens are still losing water. Um, and so we really need to get those hoses out on our favorite trees that we want to make sure we keep in our landscape and water them during the day. Um, make sure you turn your hose off at night. Otherwise, you're going to have a nice, beautiful ice sculpture in the morning, but we can water them, um, really help those trees, and then keep doing those rain dances, and hopefully we'll get some rain on the western part of the state. I know here in Lincoln and Omaha, you guys have been getting some rain a little bit more than we have. We've had 20 hundreds in the last two months, so yeah. rain is what we need, so water your trees right now. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> quince, John. That's right. So I brought, this is a flowering quince. Uh, typically, so um, the fruiting quince is, is the, the traditional, and it produces a fruit sort of like a very large pear. Uh, it's a very fun fruit. This is a flowering variety that I borrowed from the backyard farmer garden. Mm -hmm. um, but what I wanted to use this for, it has nice big flowers, and these are very pretty, this orange color. But what I wanted to do is talk about, these are closely related to like our fruit trees, like apples and peaches and pears and things like that. Uh, and I wanted to show, you know, we have sort of spring hasn't arrived <laughs> quite yet uh, and we get are getting cooler temperatures. And if we get down cold enough, like close to frost, we can actually damage our fruiting flowers. Uh, and even though the flower still looks fine, so you can, if it gets cold enough, it'll kill the entire flower. But it's, uh, you can actually get cold enough to where you don't actually kill the entire flower, but you kill the actual part that produces the fruit, uh, which is the ovary. Uh, and what you do is you actually pull some flowers off of the trees uh, and you open them up. Uh, and it's really hard to see here. I'm gonna try to point uh, with my knife and these, the camera guys really hate me. But, um, so you'll wanna just look in here and you wanna see is it still green or whitish color? If you see like a black spot or a dark spot, that means that the ovary has actually been killed. So you can check out your trees to see, you know, if you get like a cold night or something, you can see, uh, will I still get fruit? Because we sometimes get those questions like, oh, well, I had my, tr my tree flowered a lot and they didn't die over winter. Uh, from chill, but I still got no fruit, and that could be why. <laughs> that could be, or else it's lack of Jody's insects. But right, quince is really nice, and those are really pretty in the backyard farmer garden. Thanks, John. All right, first round of questions. Jody, uh, this viewer sent this picture last fall, and it's a lilac, or maybe was. This is from Aurora, and obviously she is wanting to know what this is and what she can do about it so this does not happen again this year. I don't think this is insect. What do you think it is? I don't know, Amy. What do you think it is? <laughs> so when I took a look at it and was doing some investigation, there is an ascaida ask a kind of leaf spot that we'll see on lilacs. It's not real common, mm -hmm. but it will give us that white lesion that we're seeing here with a darker border. Typically for us, it's not a huge issue. Um, the trick is it all has to do with water and timing. So if this is a lilac in your landscape to help prevent it from developing this year, make sure you're not sprinkling up on that foliage. We're keeping that water down. It's gonna be the big thing that you can do. Um, beyond that, um, I wouldn't be too worried about it. 
Excellent. So now you owe Jody a question. <laughs> I'll give her all the questions she wants. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> the next one, uh, Jody, comes from Douglas County. And it is, what is this huge beetle-looking bug? Came out of a fallen tree, and they're worried that there are more, and they'll either kill the trees or get into their house. So what do they do about it? Okay, so this is a, a wood roach. So they're cockroaches that live outdoors in the woods. They are probably in a dead tree or fallen tree between the, the bark layers, and there probably is more of them. They can get into houses when they sneak under the door accidentally, or they're brought in with firewood. Uh, the adults, so that's a nymph, so an immature, the adult males have wings and they can fly. They're attracted to light, so keep your porch lights off when you don't, uh, when you have doors open, and uh, they should stay out. All right, thank you. Rock, your first one here is uh, from a Lincoln viewer, and she has sent us this picture, and it's in the center there by that piece of mulch for our viewers, but she, she wants us to ID this plant and then tell her what will kill it. That looks like a seedler, a seed cedar. A cedar seedling, or a, seed, a seedling. <laughs> it's a cedar seedling. <laughs> say you that say that fast times three fast. times. <laughs> and, and um, you know, I, it, really there, there are herbicides that will control it that consumers can buy. Unfortunately, they have a long soil residual and they could kill surrounding trees. So I'm not gonna suggest that herbicide, but actually uh, anything glyphosate based does a pretty good job on it. And, um, and then, you know, you can obviously, if this one's, this is a young one and it looks like it's been hacked back a couple of times so it started to branch a little more, but I'm gonna say hit it with glyphosate. Well, and again, I think one of the issues is we're seeing Eastern red cedar seed itself into turf and then people are mowing it, but not low enough. Right. Right, all right, so keep was your that, eyes Was up. that turf? That looked like a garden. Was that actually in turf? Mm -hmm. She said it was in her turf. And oh, okay. We've seen it all over in, in parks and things in Lincoln, so. Bad, bad cedars. Well, in eastern rose cedar, if you're going to cut it, you make sure there's no green left. Right. Got to get it down at the soil line. All right. So you have a couple more, and these are fun, um, <laughs> because these are from Odo County, and this is a viewer. We've done a segment on their beautiful acreage, and this is the, the prairie that they have planted in their ditch. So they're showing the burn. Do you want to talk just a bit about how you actually manage prairie or turf and how to uh, prairie turfs or turf grasses and uh, so this kind of thing? Burning is, is, is as old as time, right? And, mm -hmm. and nature took care of it and then we started to quit burn and then probably why we have as many cedar trees as we do, right? So burning is a great cedar control method, but I really like the fact that they're using a burn. You know, there's no herbicide inputs on this. That takes care of not only weeds, but some diseases and other things as well. Um, and so in that case, we've got a, a, you've got a really good chance to get rid of things that you want, including some of the annual weed seeds and, and those sort of things. So that burn works really well. It looks like they had it set up right. I've done a number of controlled burns. They had the back burn set up. You could see the direction of the wind. So kudos to them for as good as that was looking and, and kudos to them for using traditional old school kind of techniques to maintain that prairie because you get a lot of regrowth. You can also get release of any natives that are there or any seed that's there. And so what you end up with is a really healthy stand and, and a minimal amount of invasive and other species, especially it's great for controlling uh, woody invasive species. Excellent, thanks Rock. All right, Amy, mm -hmm. um, this is actually, it comes to you because she thought these oh. were insect eggs. Mm -hmm these large shell looking things associated with an insect that will come back to Jody. Are those in, they're insect? Are they some sort of fungus? What do you think those when I was, are? When I was looking at it, I kind of went back and forth. I really think it's probably some type of fungus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, slime molds and a lot of those. Um, stink horns, stink horns kind of look like an egg, mm -hmm. um, gelatinous egg. And so there's a lot of different various mm -hmm. forms. So. It's a good guy. It's eating the saprophytic. It's mm -hmm. a saprophytic. It's going to give us more carbon and nitrogen for our plants. All right. So let it be. And yeah, let it's it be. a little too big to be an insect or we're in a lot of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, your next one's here. This is a Greenwood viewer. She said, you've got a couple pictures. All the neighbor's hostas are up and out of the ground. And although the leaves aren't open, they look good. She's had these hostas for a couple of years. We've got a close up here and I think we have another picture on this one, yep. And this is what the foliage looked like last fall. She didn't clean it up, 
this is what they look like this week, and there aren't any shoots or sprouts. What do you think? So, you know, the first picture that she had was a little bit closer. You know, there's a little bit of black spots on there. I'm leaning more to that being alternary, which is, in this situation, is a good guy because he's breaking down the dead organic matter. So my recommendation right now is clean off the old foliage. Why your hostas may not be up versus your neighbors. You know, how much water has been on your hostas versus the neighbor. Maybe the neighbors watered theirs. Is it more shaded in your area? So it, there's a potential soil temperature differences. Maybe her area or their area is a little bit warmer while the hostas are coming up. Just give them some time. Um, things are slow. Um, we've been cooler. Soil temperatures are still cool. You just need to be patient. Um, I know it feels like we're the third week of April. Everything should be up and blooming and just give it some time. Okay. They're, they're coming. Thanks, Amy. All right, John, your first one here is a what is this? Uh, and she says this plant is blooming in a barren place in the lawn. Looks like a violet, walks like a violet, talks like a violet. Doesn't look like a violet. What is it? <laughs> well, it's actually, we think, a, a close relative. It's mm -hmm. a viola. So basically, mm -hmm. it's sort of like a very small type of violet relative. So uh, it's very pretty. I mean, you can leave it in the lawn if you if you want to. It's not hurting anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it'll bloom in spring. The leaves aren't as big and uh, and sort of visible as, as violet leaves are in the lawn. So if that's your concern, you don't have to worry about that as much. So, uh, you know, I think just, Let it just leave it. Let it be. That's right. the theme of tonight. We'll start so singing it now. So your next one is a Syracuse viewer, John. Uh, she has tomatoes in containers. Leaves starting to curl, happened last year, lost some plants. They have been repotted. What do, what do we think here? I mean, there's a few things, and Amy could weigh in if she wants to, uh, but I think that uh, it's actually just water, like overwatering is probably the issue. You get root rot, root damage with that, and you'll get the curling of the leaves, mm -hmm. and so I think that's the big, and I sort of zoomed in on the soil, and it actually looked kind of damp, so I would cut back on the watering just to make sure you're not overwatering and damaging the roots. <laughs> Excellent, all right, thanks, John. Well, you know, this time of year, people are flocking to the garden centers to pick up vegetables, ornamentals, turf products. Let's take a few minutes to watch our first feature tonight that focuses on what's new at the garden center that is not something you plant. We can't really start spring without talking about some of the new or unusual things that are on the market that you might want for your own home landscape. One of the ones that's been popular for a number of years is wildflower mix in a box or garden in a box. Lots more choices now and they're seeds so you're going to want to make sure you read that label so you know exactly what sorts of plants you're getting. Are they annual? Are they perennial? Are they going to grow for you? But it is really a great way to scatter that seed, stand back, do it properly and watch it grow. We talk all the time about good soil health, whether it's in your landscape or in those containers that are ever more popular. And we have a lot of new materials or newer materials available that have maybe more organic options. Some of those ingredients that you might not think of as being great for your garden, but they really are. You probably aren't going to want to buy bagged soil for a whole landscape, but if you look, you can even buy things now like cocoa fiber, a brick, that you add water to, it expands. It is one of those ingredients that will help make that soil health better for whatever you're trying to grow. Keeping with that trend of trying to attract pollinators to your landscape, using natural or organic materials, touching that earth lightly and creating good soil, we of course have a bee hotel. This is not a new trend, but it's one that is still wildly popular. You don't have to build your own, you can buy your own that just looks like a piece of artwork. And then we have this really interesting moss pole, which is bendable, and you could actually grow plants like orchids, which are wildly popular again as a house plant, in this pole and turn it into this fabulous artistic creation in your house. House plants, succulents, and all those really interesting containers are every bit as popular as they've been for the last couple of years. Almost an infinite variety of beautiful objects you can add to your landscape or your garden or grow inside. And of course, what is old is new again because we have macrame plant hangers. The squirrels might take a bite out of them. It might be worth it if you don't want to create your own. 
go to your garden center, look at what you can use to make your plants healthier and your landscape more beautiful. So while you are at that favorite garden store, take a few extra minutes to look around at some of those new or new to you or old to us exciting products that are available. All right, Jody, your next questions. This is, uh, she thinks this is a locust. You have two pictures infested with tiny black bugs. They're on the house, windows, et cetera. If you get close to the tree, you're gonna be covered. They don't bite, but they're a nuisance and the leaves had eggs. What do you think these are? Well, we've had a lot of calls about hackberry psyllids. And so they're tiny little bugs. They sound exactly like that. They get through the screens and sometimes they do kind of like minute pyre bugs pierce, but um, they're only around hackberry trees. They're the ones that create those galls, those hackberry nipple galls mm -hmm. on the leaves um, throughout the year. Yeah, so we yeah, need a little better yeah. picture of the tree to know exactly. Yeah. There's yeah. not really anything that you can do about it. Okay. All right, so then we have your second picture here, your third picture is, they're calling them these creepy grub things that were in a tree hole. What are they, what damage do they do, and how do you get rid of them? Yeah, so they're from the same beetle family as like Japanese beetles and mass shavers, so they're a scarab beetle, but because they're not in the turf and they're in rotting wood, they're probably an Osmoderma beetle, which um, their common name as a beetle, they look like little tanks, um, is, they're called the odor of leather beetle, and that's because they smell like leather. <laughs> odor but, of leather. Yeah, but they won't do any damage to any of the trees because the trees are already dead, the ones that they're in. So. Right, Entomologists are so creative. <laughs> <laughs> or not, plant bug. <laughs> okay, so Rock, you have three pictures uh, from this viewer. This is in Plattsmouth, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, patches of a different grass and a fescue acreage. They're a distraction, they seem to be spreading, so he's got the far away showing the patches. Uh, he's got one a little closer and a little closer yet, and he wants to know what they are, can you control them, and what is to prevent this? So I'm guessing, and then the third picture, they actually show it, and this has got, it, <coughs> I'm guessing, not guessing, I'm pretty sure that this is one of the uh, winter annual type grasses, like downy brome or cheat grasses sometimes is what it's called, or annual bluegrass, it doesn't have the typical bluegrass tip, so I'm gonna say this is, um, Downy brome in that lawn. I've never seen it clump up like that, but it looks like he takes pretty good care of that lawn. Plus, you know, we're at the time of year where things are really slow to get going. We would more normally expect downy brome under unmowed conditions to be up outwards of eight to 10 inches and really green. So I'm guessing it's one of the winter annuals. I'm thinking it's probably downy brome. All right. And there's nothing they can do about it. <laughs> At this point in time. He doesn't want to hear that. I know he doesn't, but that's what he's going to hear. All right, and your next question, this is a Grand Island viewer, and he sent this, and he wonders if this is your favorite zoysia grass. So it's either zoysia or Bermuda grass, and, and mm -hmm. the reason I, th I think it's Bermuda grass is that zoysia has really tight nodes, so between the leaves, that region is called the node. And mm. it's a lot tighter, and the lengthy inner node tells me that this is one of the northern adapted um, Bermuda grasses, and they can be extremely um, intrusive. And um, if they want to control it, it's, you know, there's only one thing they can do. They can either hand pull it, but they're going to probably leave rhizomes behind. So they're going to have to use a systemic non-selective because there's no selective control for that. All right. Thank you, Rock. All right, Amy, this came to us from Extension in Adams County, as you know. <laughs> but it's a cabbage that um, it was brought to Master Gardener meeting. The blackened areas were inside, so you couldn't see anything on the outside. They want to know what happened, and obviously people who grow cabbages probably don't want this to happen. Right, and you can run into it even buying a cabbage from the grocery store. Mm -hmm. So what this actually is is black rot, which is a bacterial infection. And so this infection happened late in the growing season. So it didn't actually go to the rot. And so all those black is the bacteria in all the vascular bundles in the cabbage. You can eat it, it doesn't hurt anything. Um, if it would have occurred earlier, if it was in your garden, you would actually get a full soft rot of that head and it will get gross, nasty, disgusting. So at this point in time, it's perfectly fine. All right, uh, you have three pictures here and this is, this is a little bit of a head scratcher. So it's coming to you for some reason, but okay. this is a established star crimson rhubarb, which is a mm -hmm. good one. He thinks something or somebody is munching on the leaves. They did cover it. Your second and third pictures show something 
not really munchy, but what do you think? So there is an ascochyta leaf spot on rhubarb. And so as that lesion gets older, it falls out. And so you get that ragged appearance, almost looks like, I call it more like hail damage. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like uh, hail pieces have hit it. Typically it's one of those that we don't treat for, we don't worry about it. If you are concerned about it, pull those stalks of rhubarb first uh, when you're ready to harvest. And when you cut those leaves off, don't throw them right back down into your bed. Remove those leaves further away so you help stop that cycle. But it's most likely an ascochyta leaf spot, nothing to really worry about. All right, thanks, Amy. Okay, uh, John, your first two pictures here are red bud in Omaha. Uh, we have the whole tree and then we have a little closer up and, and her concern on the bark picture is that she thinks there's a creature chewing on it. What do you think on that, on the other picture on this one? I, I don't know that there really is. It's, you know, we get shaggy bark on those sometimes. They're pretty resilient trees. Uh, and we just get some of that, you know, where, like freeze and thaw or like the weather and we get that, that sort of shagginess on those. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. Uh, you know, you just want to shape the tree nicely. It looked like there had been like a, a dead branch at one point and part of it was still stuck on there. So maybe look at getting that pruned up a little bit better to sort of reshape the tree. Um, you know, and, and I think you've got it planted in an okay place. They're sort of like an edge tree. So they liked a little bit of shade, a little bit of sun, uh, and they grow, you know, wild. So that you always see them like on the edge of a forest in a natural planting. Of course, in Nebraska, we don't have like big forests where they would be on the edge of, but I think, you know, just sort of baby it along and, and see how it goes. But I think it looks fine. All right, and your next two pictures are uh, Lincoln Viewer. She has a big white pine and she has actually the, the evergreen ivy growing up the trunk. She's wondering if the ivy is gonna hurt the tree. Well, you know, I'm not a big fan of letting ivy and things like that grow on trees. I mean, that ivy right there is not doing a lot of damage. It sends little rootlets in to stick onto the, the trunk of the tree, but it's not like pulling nutrients or resources from the tree, but you could get like rots and stuff where it stays wet underneath. And if you do let the ivy, like if it's a smaller tree or if it grows big enough to sort of like overwhelm the canopy and like uh, drown out the leaves from the tree, you can get some death because you're actually like sort of covering over the leaves. So I would just, I would just watch it, but I'm not a fan of ivy and trees. <laughs> <laughs> coming from the east. Right. right, coming from the east where it's like an invasive species. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, well, once again, Terry is going to take us inside the greenhouse at the Backyard Farmer Garden to show us a featured plant that we'll be planting very soon. Here's Terry James to tell us more. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're gonna do a little review Last week on the Backyard Farmer Show, I brought a really cute tomato. We're growing it for the Backyard Farmer Garden and I'm gonna introduce it completely to you today. This is called Orange Hat. It is a very cute ultra dwarf tomato. This tomato will actually only get to be six to nine inches tall and it's gonna have yellow cherry tomatoes on it. This one is great to be able to put into containers. It would be fantastic on your patio or deck. Be on the lookout for this orange hat tomato in the backyard farmer garden this summer. See how it works. You'll be able to grow it, order the seed, and plant it next year. So stop by the backyard farmer garden and check it out. Right now it is time for lightning. All right, John, you're up. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, we'll see. We'll see. I've been studying since September. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so multiple questions about raised beds. The first being what type of wood would be best to use for a raised bed? So you can actually use treated lumber now because it's not treated with arsenic anymore. It's not, uh, it's copper. Uh, you can use cedar, it gets expensive. You just don't wanna use something that will rot quickly. So no plain pine. All right, um, this viewer says her peas are up and her concern is it's going to be so hot this weekend and maybe next week, what should she do to keep them from like croaking? Just make sure they're well watered. All right. Is, to, is using topsoil or soils from last year's containers okay to just go ahead and spread in the garden? Yes, it is. All right, what is the real last 
frost date in eastern Nebraska? Uh, so the range is April 29th uh, to May 12th. <laughs> All right, this viewer bought a uh, Swiss chard in little four inch four packs and it looks beautiful. Can they just go ahead and put it in containers or out and will it last all summer? Uh, they should be able to put it out and it will last all summer and into next year because it's a biennial. Excellent, nice job, John. Welcome. Okay, Amy. Only if it brings rain. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see, which does he know? <laughs> all right, are you ready? Yeah. Uh, this is a Plattsmouth viewer, and, and uh, he's saying his crab apples were pretty diseased last year. They're already flowering, and we say that the, you know, the very first spray is pink bud. Is it too late to do any sort of spray for the, for the At crab apples? At this point in time, I would say you're probably still okay, um, depending, since we have been so dry. We need that moisture. So I would still go ahead and try to get that application on. Sooner is better than later. All right. Uh, this is a viewer who apparently has a, a gazebo with like the skirt goes down to the ground mm -hmm. and they have what they think is dry rot on the boards. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you can treat and get rid of? Ooh, dry rot's a hard one. Um, you can try to slow it down with like a 10% bleach, but most time it's already working its way up. Um, best thing is to replace the skirting and use treated lumber. All right, this is an Omaha viewer who says their ornamental pears are in full flower already and they had pear rust last year. Is it too late to treat for pear rust? Just like the crab apple, since we have been dry, get it on this weekend and it should provide you some protection. All right, this is a Henderson viewer who wants to know whether they can use um, composted manure straight from the farm in their garden. Yes, but you need to ask very important questions. Um, what do they use if they use a herbicide on that hay? There is a great article on CropWatch from two weeks ago where they talk more about it and list the products that would have that carryover effect um, because that product can actually go through the entire ruminant system of uh, bovine and it's still active. So need to have those questions. If not, your tomatoes are going to look a little rough. That was heat lightning. <laughs> I was. <laughs> Sorry. All right, Rock, are you ready? Sure. <laughs> Um, this is a viewer who, uh, this is from Northeast Nebraska actually, and they, it, where it's been really, really dry. And they're, they're wondering still, is it still important to aerate now, or is it too late? To We're gonna it? say delay aeration because it does injure the turf a little bit. Wait till those soil temps get up into the mid 50s or later, right around pre-emergent time, and it'll have no effect on the pre-emergent, but we're a little early just based on soil temperatures. All right, uh, and this is also from Northeast Nebraska, and they're wondering, about dethatching the lawn this year since it's been so dry and sh should they do that? Uh, ditto on what you do with aeration. If you're plugging or if you're dethatching, both have some injury and you want to have at least 30 days, 15 to 30 days of good growing weather post. And right now we're not sure what's happening. So we're gonna say, <laughs> let's, let's just wait a couple more weeks at least. All right, uh, this is a Columbus viewer who is saying tenacity he wants to use tenacity, but he wants to know, is it available in a less concentrated, less costly form for homeowners rather than the concentrate? Uh, that's a great question. And, and the Scott's miracle Grow company has the tenacity, the rights to tenacity for consumers. Just look at the label for mesotrione or mesotrione on the label, and that's the same product as tenacity. It's granular, so it's easier to apply. All right, excellent, <clears throat> nice job. All right, last but not least, you ready? Yes. Okay, so the first question here is people who have caterpillars that eat their petunias every single year, what, it, what can you treat with so you, that doesn't happen? Um, that, those are tough, but uh, spinosad will work well and won't hurt the bees. All right, uh, we have people who are saying they have fungus gnats all over everything inside. What yeah. to do about fungus gnats? Stop watering your plants so much. Let them dry out a little bit. I had one fly up my nose today at the office. I don't have any plants. I do. I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we have another viewer who uh, uses hibiscus in containers outside and wants to know is there a systemic or something they can use to control insects on those? Probably Japanese beetles, right? Probably yeah. Japanese beetles. Um, there's actually yeah. uh, a systemic and it, it's, it's a metachlorpyrid, but it's, it will say like for house plants and it, that you have to make sure on the label it says that it's in a container and that you can use it in a container. All right, uh, ticks are here, yes Oh yeah, 
Ticks are here. All right, and people should be particularly aware of which one. Actually, all of them. There are three different species that we have. They all can, you know, transmit disease. So uh, do your, check your crevices. Do your tick checks. <laughs> Hand that to John. Now you don't get to keep it. Oh. I was going for quality oh, over a, quantity. Oh, it was a tie with Jody, so yeah. you have to pass it down oh. in a minute. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> <laughs> between the offices. One minute with it. Right. <laughs> we have joint custody. <laughs> All right. So plants of the week, John. Uh, so this lovely white flower we have here, this uh, is a red leaf Macdenia. Uh, they see this beautiful white flower. It's in bloom now. It blooms very early. So we get uh, this nice mound of beautiful green foliage that then is, uh, you know, we get this early flower. And then down below here, uh, we see these leaves. This is a painted Japanese arum. Uh, and so it's really interesting because uh, we have this sort of evergreen foliage throughout the winter uh, that actually dies back when it starts to bloom. And it has uh, a flower sort of similar to like a jack in the pulpit, if you uh, know what that is. It's a spathe and spadix uh, type of flower. Uh, so the, the, ever, the, the leaves die back in the summer, but then come back in the fall and they overwinter. <laughs> Excellent, and those are both shade plants, and, and they're actually both on campus in our courtyard. So, all right, Jody, questions. Um, this is, uh, you have two here. This is a viewer who says they moved some appliances and found these winged insects coming up from beneath them. Are they ants? Why were they there? Are there they more? <laughs> How to get rid of them? And there's another picture here. These are termites. Ooh. This is actually what I studied in grad school. <laughs> And it, this is actually a good show because you saw winged ants earlier. So mm -hmm. this is what winged termites look like. They don't have that skinny waist. They kind of look like a, a pill, I guess. But they've got four equal wings. If they moved an appliance inside, they're swarming. That means there is a colony somewhere. So there may be some damage in the walls. But these are subterranean termites, so they do maintain some contact with the ground. And so... <clears throat> Excuse me, so the soil needs to be treated, I would call a professional, or if this is a tenant to you know, let their property manager know, they will need to have that treated. And there's different options, liquid termiticide or bait or both, but this is something that a professional needs to take care of. All right, thanks, Jody. Uh, your next picture is, uh, they're saying this looks like a whole bunch of flies all bunched up together in the corner of a window. Why are they there? Did they hatch from something in the window or the wall and are they harmful? All good questions. These are <laughs> called cluster flies as they cluster together, but these are one of our many overwintering pests or fall invaders. So they come in through the fall, similar to those box elder bugs and that Western conifer seed bug that you had last week. So they came in in the fall and they want to get out. Um, it's just not really that nice out yet, but they are not considered filth flies. They actually are uh, parasites of earthworms. Okay. Excellent. Okay, Rock, uh, your first one here is, um, could be from anybody. It's Hooper, Nebraska. And three pictures. We have this weed that is super invasive. They can c control it in the vegetable and flower gardens by pulling and mulching. It's taken over the lawn. What is it? So this is ground ivy, which is a perennial member of the a mint family has a square stem, but it's not a lamium. So not that that means anything, but it is a perennial. It is very, very aggressive um, in the lawn. There's really no way to control it other than using uh, any, any herbicide that has phylloxapyr in it. Uh, generally does a pretty good job. Stay away from products that have uh, 2,4-D in them, um, number one, because they tend to drift into sensitive ornamentals. And the other reason is, is that it just doesn't work very well on uh, ground ivy. It's also a low nitrogen lover. So if the lawn is under fertilized, we see a, just a, a, an explosion of ground ivy. All right, and your, your, your next picture is an Omaha viewer and is wondering how to get rid of the invasive purple flower without destroying everything else. It must be purple flower night on a backyard <laughs> farmer. <laughs> this is dead nettle, um, and I'm not positive it's a perennial or an annual. I think it may be an annual, but it's very aggressive, um, and it looks a lot like ground ivy, except the flower color and the flower position is a, is a little bit different, and the leaf is not serrated like it is on and ground ivy. And, and once again, there it depends on where it is. I don't, did they say it was in the garden or the lawn? Uh, it looks like it's on edge of sidewalk, maybe. Yeah, I would just glyphosate that with some, you know, one of the um, glyphosate-containing products because it really will do a good job. I'd probably use a spreader sticker when I did it because it's got a kind of a wacky, thick cuticle leaf on it, and it'll be difficult to control. All right. Thanks, Rock. 
Okay, Amy, this is a Lincoln viewer, and one picture here, it's an older red twig dogwood, not one of the new ones. Full sun by itself in a corner, but some of the branches are gray and blotchy. What is it and what does she do about it? So dogwoods are notorious for getting canker, and that's what you have here. This is a great time of year to prune it out because you can see it. Mm -hmm. um, prune it out. Uh, you want to go six to eight inches below where you see that brown. Um, but with dogwoods, it kind of looks like an older cane. I would just trim that one all the way back down to the ground. All right. Uh, you have two pictures here, and this is a Lincoln viewer. She's had this old shrub rose for about 20 years. It's between a couple of big fitzers and the sidewalk. Blooms dark pink beautifully. A couple of years here, it's had all these dark or dead canes in these reddish places right now. What is this? So most likely we're looking at black <coughs> spot on the canes themselves. Um, so the best thing is you wanna prune those out because that will cause black spot on your leaves. Um, so prune it out, dispose of it and then just be on the lookout for black spot development later on and treat it with a fungicide as needed. All right, excellent. Okay, John, your first questions here, uh, two of them. This is a Bennett viewer. Um, she has invasive tree of heaven, which of course we all think is tree of somewhere else, mm -hmm. uh, on the east side of her older home. They wanna create a walkout basement. They wanna control the tree roots and they're wondering whether they should remove the larger tree. This is in Bennett. Yeah, I would go ahead and take those out if you could. What I would do is you know, cut them down, do some sort of treatment to actually kill out the plant so it won't grow back from the root. So that would be you know, some sort of uh, herbicide, probably crossbow is one that works on woody plants like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one that you wanna look at and control. And you're right, they're horrible invasive species. So yeah, get rid and of they it. Will, they will continue to yeah. come up. Yeah. yeah. All right, John. You have one more. The cut scheme is cut stem is a cut, cut stem, stem is a good right. way okay. to go as well. Yeah. So you cut the stem and then before it starts to bleed, you spray yeah. it. Then then you remove the tree after it has a chance to translocate. Exactly. Yeah. Good. Okay. So this uh, this viewer, one picture here. Once he wants to control everything uh, along the tracks here. This is a private rail line, and it's overgrown with weeds and trees. So what do yeah. we do here? Same thing. It would thing actually or? be the same recommendation, just cut down and do the cut stem and then do the, the crossbow treatment on, on that as well. All right, excellent, thanks John. Well you know, good gardeners know everything starts with good soil and good soil starts with lots of organic matter that you can actually make in your backyard with composting. Here's Mary Jane from the Lancaster Extension Office to tell us how it's done. Spring is a great time to start a compost pile or to add material to your existing compost bins. Compost is beneficial because it reduces yard waste in the landfill and it adds organic matter to your landscape beds. The items you put in a compost bin include leaves, grass clippings, pine needles, organic waste from the kitchen like uh, vegetable scraps, any type of um, coffee grounds, or eggshells. Things you don't want to put in the compost is pet waste, meat scraps, or dairy products. When deciding what type of compost system you have, choose one that would work best for you. There are different types of bin systems that are one, two, or three bins. When placing your bins in your landscape, it's good to be near the garden and a water source. Try not to place it too close to the house or the neighbor's property line. So when you start your compost bin, you want it to be three feet tall and three feet wide. You want to do it in layers. So start with four to six inches of your high carbon material, which is also called the browns. So this would be like your tree leaves. Then you would add uh, your high nitrogen or the greens, which would be like your vegetable scraps. And then you add about an inch of uh, soil or uh, existing compost to add the microorganisms to start the composting process. Then you wanna also add a little bit of moisture to, or water to get it moist. Then you turn that and mix it together. 
and then you start the layering process over until your bin is full. There are two types of composting methods. The passive method is where you create the, the compost pile and then you just leave it. It will take up to six months to two years for it to break down and be compost. Or you can do an active bin where you're turning it every 10 to 14 days and you will have compost in three to four months. Compost, when it's finished, is crumbly, brown, and it has an earthy smell. There are lots of things you can use compost for. You can put it in your vegetable and flower gardens. You would need to add about an inch of your compost to the site and then work it in three inches. Compost is also great for raised beds, container gardens, or after you aerate your turf, you can broadcast the compost over the turf area to improve the organic matter in the soil. So you don't have to buy compost. You've probably got all the ingredients you need already to get started. You can see this and many other great features and programs on the Backyard Farmer YouTube channel. Take a few minutes to check it out after the show. Make sure you hit subscribe and you'll get all our cool information. And we, we make our compost for the Backyard Farmer Garden too, so that's pretty neat. All right, uh, Jody, this is a, a picture here taken on the 20th of April, Southeast Lincoln. Please help identify this. It appears to be a dragonfly. He says it's a little early. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, they do usually come out around this time. This is a green darner dragonfly, one of our largest. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love dragonflies. Well, and we appreciate that he taped a quarter yep. to the ceiling of the porch. Yeah, so that was nice. Big. All right, uh, you have a, a second one here, one picture. And it, this is a Douglas County viewer. This outside of their house has been covered with these little insects. What are they? Do they bite? When will they go away or do they need to be treated? Okay, so these are called non-biting midges. So they're a type of fly <laughs> that doesn't bite and uh, they're, you know, they're aquatic as a larvae. So anywhere there's like a a river, lake, pond, man-made or not. So what you can do is turn your porch lights off at night, um, run a fan if you're on a patio so they can't you know, come around you. If you've got a pond, you could have, you know, dump it to get rid of any larvae that's overwintering or uh, get some predatory fish <laughs> for your pond. For, for the pond, I was gonna say, for the porch? For your or pond. Like, turn them loose on the porch, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, uh, Rock, you have two pictures here. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer. He's saying for the first time ever, part of his lawn is, has spotty kill. And what is the problem and what is the solution? I think your next one's a close up here. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think we're still waiting for things to green up and you have different cultivars of, of the same species or different species and they just green up at different times. And this slow climb that we've done on soil temps, I think that's what's going. I think this lawn's gonna be fine in a, another two to three weeks, depending upon temperature. What is the soil temp right now? It's, a, it's in the mid 40s mm. in eastern Nebraska. Okay, so we're not even close. No. All right. Uh, your next picture here is, this is a Lincoln viewer. This is an older neighborhood, maybe 1960s. They're wondering why the turf is striped like this down the middle and then some of the turf is green and some of the turf is brown and they want it all to be like the strip down the middle. Well, I, th I think that was been cult. Maybe they put in a drain line or some sort of, um, you know, there was some sort of electrical work done or they pulled, pulled cable and that loosens up the soil. So it looks like that entire lawn might be able to look like that if you had a little bit of aeration going on. You also notice there was a lot going on in that picture. Up in between the two houses where it was protected, it was very green. So, you know, it, it got tempered from the, the extreme cold and wind a little bit. And then that, the house to the right in the picture looked like they may have put some salt or something on their driveway and then it rolled down the side. So that picture had a lot going on in it. You can see that it looks like there was some wash, but I think that center got cultivated, you know, they, and then they, they either laid in new sod, which it doesn't sound like they did, but it just, that extra aeration in the profile uh, made that turf green up and just survive better. All right, um, Amy, you have, uh, this is a Southwest Omaha viewer for starters. This is a red sunset maple. 
about 20 years old. He did not send us a picture of the whole tree, but okay. he did send us this two inches by six inches break in the bark that's looking a little bit suspect in there and he wonders treatment or... So most likely this is looking like maybe it was a freeze crack, but it's definitely turned into a canker now, mm -hmm. a most likely fungal. The trick with those fungal cankers is they're gonna keep working their way in and start rotting that heartwood. So depending on where it is on the tree, since we didn't see the exact location, would make a big difference on long-term stability of that tree. We know long-term the tree's not gonna survive. It's also gonna make it more susceptible for severe wind, ice, and to break. And so if it's a tree that could potentially hit your house or your car or your neighbor's house, you may wanna consider removal eventually because the integrity is going to be limited. All right, thanks, Amy. And your next one is a... Um Let's see, what is your next one? Oh, it's this really odd looking sort of, what is that? Some type of Maybe, evergreen? Oh something? yeah, this is the dwarf Alberta spruce. Oh, it was an he evergreen was at a, one yeah, point in time. He, he thought it was a miniature pine tree. Yeah, it's dwarf Alberta spruce. And they're wondering <laughs> what this could be. Is this canker? Is this tree long for the world? We're gonna use Lauren's favorite term, prune at ground level. Mm -hmm. um, most likely it's a combination. It could have a canker, but a lot of winter desiccation, most likely, just by the looks of it. Um, where it's more severe, I would, I would suspect that's probably a south side, um, wind damage type stuff. Print a ground around level and start over. Or giant dog or spider mites or I, yeah. <laughs> any of those things. It's not coming back. Okay, John, uh, you're also on the, the uh, dead evergreen list here mm -hmm. because your first picture here is a Lincoln viewer wondering if there is any hope for this fairly new evergreen tree. There is hope for this tree to in a second career as a tumbleweed. <laughs> uh, so, this, so this is an ever brown, not an evergreen anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way that evergreens function, once all the, the part of the branch turns brown, it is dead, it'll never come back. So this is never coming back. <laughs> all right, and your second one here, uh, this is a Council Bluffs viewer. It's a, the, it's a little blurry or he wanted to know what the tree is, but he does say it hasn't grown since it was planted two to three years ago and he wants to cut it down because he thinks it's ugly. Well, go right ahead and cut it down because we don't know what it is. And if you don't like it, cut it out. So don't keep a plant that you don't like. So there you go. <laughs> All right, so always, of course, we have announcements of way cool, fun things in the gardening world. And our first one here is Greenhouse Days, which is Harmony Nursery and Daylily Farm, April 18th through the 30th, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5.30, Saturday, 9 to 3. Our second one is on the screen, which is Spring Affair Plant Sale, April 29th and April 30th, Lancaster County Event Center, and that's always a, a good, fun event for everybody. And we have Digging Deeper coming up. So this is Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. You can watch this on Facebook. There is a brand new segment coming next Thursday, and that can be followed on Backyard Farmer and Nebraska Public Media. That segment will actually be on avian flu. So uh, anybody who uh, enjoys their backyard chicken flock would be uh, wise to pay attention to this one because it is an issue. All right, we have, we have fi time for one final question, and that's coming to you, Jody, since you're <laughs> first in line. And that would be carpenter bees, not carpenter ants. Mm -hmm. Any control that can happen now if people had them last year? Or what do they do about carpenter bee damage or issues? Yeah, that one's hard. <laughs> Because, yeah. well, wherever they were yeah. nesting, they're going to emerge out of there. And they okay. tend to nest in the same places as the rest of their family. So start over or find the place and be done with it. Right. It You'd up. have to, you can treat each individual hole. Okay. All righty. Thanks.